What is rehabilitation? What makes it different? What makes it special? What makes it so we can get the best out of a disability for that person? And I think the main thing that differentiates it from most other fields is it's an educational process. It's a process where we teach people to do things for themselves so they become more independent. It's not that in rehabilitation centres we don't care for people, of course we do. But if they can manage, for example, to put their jacket on, uh, or wash or dress in the morning, we let them do it. They may struggle at first, but we teach them how to do it. We teach them how to be more independent. That's the real difference between what we do and what you, the experience you'd have on a hospital ward. It's based on the principles of what are now called activity restriction and participation restriction. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, and really activity uh, restriction is basically disability, which we all know what that means, and participation restriction is perhaps an old term of handicap. In other words, um, if we have, for example, a stroke and have a weak arm, what is called impairment is a description of that weakness. It just says, I've got a weak arm. It doesn't tell you how weak that arm is. Does it really restrict what you want to do, or does it no great um, uh, import at all? So, in rehabilitation, we focus on disability. In other words, what can you do with your weak arm? Put it into functional context, if you will. But we go further than that. We look at that weak arm and we say, well, it's, it's reasonably weak, we can't do much with it, so what is, impact does that have on your place in society? Does it affect you at home? Does it affect your family? Does it affect your work? Does it affect you at play? And so we have to think of three different areas in the rehabilitation. The impairment, the description of what's wrong, the disability which puts it into its functional context, and the handicap, how much it affects you in your role in society. The other things that differentiate rehabilitation from other specialties is that it has to be multidisciplinary. That means we have to involve more than one profession. No single profession can do this job. We need nurses, certainly. We need healthcare workers, certainly, as you will get in nursing homes. But on top of that help and assistance, we need the input from other professionals, such as physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, a dietitian a clinical psychologist or neuropsychologist, and a doctor with some expertise in rehabilitation medicine or neurology. The other principle about rehabilitation is that we set goals for the person so they know what they're doing and where they're getting there. We set a long-term goal uh, for that admission for six or eight or ten weeks. We set short-term goals, perhaps every week or every fortnight, so the person can know that they're progressing and we can measure how they're progressing. So that's the other point, is we use measurable outcomes that we, so we can monitor their progress. And the other key factor is that the whole team works around that patient or client, uh, so they're the focus of what we do. Our goals have to be relevant to that person, so they can see what's happening and they can understand where they're going, and it's relevant where they're going, both them and their family. So it's not just a cliché for us, it's a really central important part of our work is that the rehabilitation in a rehabilitation centre is client-patient focused. Let's take an example, perhaps a silly example, but one I think that illustrates the point. Let's take an 85-year-old retired miner who lost his uh, left ring finger in an accident in the mines. What is his impairment? Well, his impairment is simply a description of the problem, in other words, an absent ring finger. That doesn't tell us anything about the difficulties he has as a result of that impairment. So we have to think what his disability might be, what does it stop him doing, what is the function of the hand, and we have to think of the context of it in his role in society. Does it stop him going down the pub, dressing in the morning? And in this example, the, clearly the answer to those latter two questions is no. Uh, he can live perfectly normal life uh, with an absent finger. Uh, he can go down to the pub, he can wash, he can dress, no problem. But you compare that with exactly the same impairment in a 35-year-old concert pianist who's lost his finger in an accident. His impairment is exactly the same, loss of the finger. But his disability is profoundly different because he cannot play the piano. And more particularly, if that was his job as a professional pianist, he's almost certainly lost his job. So exactly the same impairment has profound differences 
in terms of the impact that that impairment has on the person. That's the sort of thing in a rehabilitation unit we have to understand, we have to put it into the context of that individual and their family, their life, their work. Let me take another example. Let me take uh, a middle-aged man who has multiple sclerosis. He's perhaps now struggling with walking. He has uh, married, he's two children, lives at home, and he works in a post room of a large company. So we think, what is his impairment? Well, his impairment is simply the description of the problem he's got. In medical terms, it is probably a spastic paraparesis, which means he has weakness um, and perhaps muscle spasm in both legs. His disability may be very mild, it may not be affecting him at all. He may be perhaps tireder than he would be at the end of the day, but he's managing to drive, he's managing his job, he's managing a tome. On the other hand, the disability could be significant and he's just struggling to get around. After he gets to work, after a journey in the car, he really feels very tired. He can't walk around the company uh, effectively or even at all to deliver his letters. He can't sit very easily to put the, the letters in the pigeonholes. When he comes home, if he does manage the job, he may be profoundly tired and not be able to participate in activities with his family or help with the, with the washing up or the cleaning at home. So the disability could be very significant and of course the participation problems there, the handicap as it used to be called, uh, can also be profound in that he may be on the verge of losing his job or at least having to go part time. So in rehabilitation terms we have to know that and understand that by talking to him and by talking to his family of course. That leads us into how we approach uh, rehabilitation. And there's three basic approaches. The first thing we can try and do is treat the disability. In this case, for example, he has a spastic paraparesis uh, and we may help that directly by reducing his spasticity. And that's the subject of another of our video clips. We may give him an antispastic drug or we may help him with physiotherapy. But that's treating the actual disability that he's got, which may improve the situation. The second approach is to, if you like, to accept the disability and teach him new skills to get around the problem. And in this simple case, it may be as straightforward as giving him a walking stick so he can improve his confidence, he can get around his workplace uh, much better and easier than without the stick. It may be for really long distances, perhaps on the supermarket, we might need to think about giving him a wheelchair. So that's the second approach, it's helping him get around the disability. And these aren't mutually exclusive, we can do both of course. But in rehabilitation we look further than that, we look at how it is affecting him in society, how it's affecting him at work. And in this example, we might want to go to work. Perhaps the occupational therapist could go with him, with his permission to the work and say, well, to his employer, why don't you give him perhaps a stool in the post room so he can sit on the stool while he's putting the letters in the pigeonholes. Why don't we perhaps give him a parking place that's near the door so he doesn't have to walk from the, uh, the car park to his office and get tired before he even starts the day. Perhaps he wants to think about going part-time and again maybe a chat to his employer saying you've got a good employee here but he may be helped by going part-time. Uh, could help him perhaps in the short term, perhaps in the medium term, but help him with coping with those problems. And of course we shouldn't forget the need to go home. It may be an occupational therapist uh, can look at the stairs and put an extra banister in so he can help him go up and down the stairs. Maybe other aids and equipment that make his life a bit easier at home. It may be as straightforward as talking to his wife and his family who may not fully understand about the impact of multiple sclerosis both now and into the future. So that illustrates the three approaches. Help the disability directly, help him get round the disability and teach new skills and look at the broader context in society and see what we can do to make his life as easy as possible. So we want to set a long-term goal for that particular admission, for example, but we need to break that down into manageable bite-sized pieces. In other words, if someone's in the unit for, say, three months, we want to set goals so they know how they're getting on perhaps every week or maybe every fortnight. So a fundamental, important part of rehabilitation is to set those goals, short-term goals, medium-term goals, long-term goals. And those goals have to be meaningful. They have to be what we call smart. That means specific and measurable, achievable, relevant and time-limited. Just an example of that, for example, a goal for the person, maybe I'd like to come out of this unit, I'd like to walk better. Now that's a perfectly reasonable uh, goal, 
but it's not really measurable, it's not precise enough. So we can't think how we're going to get there and how we know whether we're getting there or not. So a, a, a good goal, a smart goal, would be perhaps to walk 100 metres in two minutes without a walking aid. Now that's, a, that's a specific goal, it's one that you can measure and one that you can set bite-sized chunks for. So at first, the first two weeks, for example, it may be just to walk with a walking aid, perhaps 50 metres. The next fortnight it may be to walk 100 metres with a walking aid and thereafter walk that distance without the walking aid. So basically those goals have to be also measurable. So you've got to know when you're getting there. And the measurement can be very simple. It can be, in this example, it can be just as simple as measuring out 100 metres in the car park and using a stopwatch. There are other more uh, standard and established outcome measures that we can use. And you've, there's some words that you may have heard of in a rehabilitation unit, very, very well known outcome scores such as the BARTEL, which measures physical progress, things called the FIM and the FAM, the functional independence measure and the functional assessment measure are very well known and standardised tools that we use. And there's various others that can measure not just physical progress, but behaviour, mood. It doesn't really matter, that's a whole talk in its own right. But basically, a fundamental principle of rehabilitation is to use goals and to set recognised outcome measures that are recognised and understood both by the staff but more particularly by the disabled person and their family so we know where we're getting to. The other key principle of rehabilitation is that it has to be conducted through the team. No one person can do this job. It is, as it's called, multidisciplinary. So many disciplines are involved in getting the right outcome for that person. And that could be nursing staff, care staff, because people will need caring for, as well as uh, promoting the, the independence programme. And most particularly it will involve other disciplines such as physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, a dietitian, a clinical psychologist, a rehabilitation physician. And a term you may have heard is, is that's multidisciplinary, but more, perhaps more important in a rehab unit is that all those disciplines have to work together. It's not just the physiotherapist coming in on a Wednesday, doing the physiotherapy and going away again. That has a purpose, but it's not as good, and the outcome is not as good. And if that team sits down together with the disabled person and their family and works out the goals between them. So this fortnight, it may be that we want to work more on if you like, walking goals through the physiotherapist. But all the other team members have to understand what those walking goals are and how to conduct the work. It may be that we want to set communication goals through the speech therapist. But again, all the team members have to understand the principles of that communication over that couple of weeks. They have to work together in an interdisciplinary fashion, as it's called. And there's good evidence that doing so produces better outcomes. So let's try and tie this together on the example. Let's take the example of a 53-year-old man who unfortunately had a stroke two or three weeks ago and he's just been admitted to the rehabilitation centre. As a result of the stroke, he's got what is called a right hemiparesis. That simply means a weakness, a clumsiness on the right side involving his arm and his leg. As a result of that, he's obviously become, understandably, become depressed and he's been admitted to the rehabilitation centre uh, to see if we can get him a little bit better and improve his quality of life in a finite period of time, perhaps over six to eight weeks. That's, so far we've got his impairment. His impairment is a description of his problem, if you remember, and it's simply a weakness down the right side. But as I've said already, we need to understand what the impact of that weakness is. What does it mean that he can do or can't do? And perhaps when he came in, he could perhaps uh, stand, but not transfer. And obviously a goal for that admission will be to improve that walking, so perhaps he can transfer, or perhaps after six or eight weeks um, he can walk, perhaps with a, a walking aid, reasonably independently. That would be a reasonable goal for that admission. But more than that, we've got to look at how he will fit back into society, if you like, what his problems are. We know he's depressed, and that will need treating and, and assisting through a psychologist in the team or through an antidepressant drug perhaps. We also need to know what help he's got when he gets home and in this guy, for example, uh, we could pretend that he had uh, looked after his wife who had a rheumatoid arthritis. So we have to bear that in mind that some people when they go home they have a lot of family support. When he goes home he may not have any family support because his wife is too disabled by the rheumatoid. Has he got other family? He lives, say, in Birmingham. His son may live in London and working, so not really able to contribute much or at all. Where does he live? 
Does he live in a fully accessible house so he can get home without any problems even when he's struggling to walk a little bit? Or does he, perhaps in this case, live in a second floor flat so to get home at all he'd have to at least manage two flights of stairs? That obviously needs to be put into context so we can understand what we can actually achieve through this goal and whether it's realistic to do that in six or eight weeks. It's also good to understand about his work. He's only 53. He probably had many years of working to go. Um, this chap, we could say, was a security guard in a, in a local uh, industrial unit. And he may well need to walk around, perhaps in the evening. Perhaps he did shift work. Is he able to get back to that? Can he get back to work at all? Can he leak back into work, if you like, uh, on a part-time basis at first? Is his employer adaptable enough to do that? We don't know. What context can we put him in in terms of society? Uh, can we help him? Will it be relevant to him to set some goals uh, to get back to, to work and play? For example, this chap was a, a keen fisherman and a football supporter for his local team. So can we help him to make his reputation relevant by perhaps the team taking him down to the local pond uh, for some fishing? Or perhaps taking him uh, to a football match to help him with his mobility? to help him with climbing stairs at the match in a relevant context. So there's a lot of interesting information there that we need to do simply by sitting the person down and talking to them and their family. That enables us to put his functional problems into context of his disability. It enables us to put it into the context of society, about his work and at home and at play. It helps us design long-term, medium-term and short-term goals, set appropriate outcome measures to make sure he's progressing towards those goals. And all that, of course, has to be delivered through the multidisciplinary team. So once again, we can see in this simple example that he will need involvement not just of nursing and care staff, but physiotherapy, occupational therapy. It doesn't say here, but perhaps he has a speech impairment, very common after stroke, but involve a speech therapist. And we know that he's depressed and will benefit from the input from a clinical psychologist and, of course, from a rehabilitation physician who may be able to help him with administering drugs as needed to manage, for example, his spasticity. So let me summarise. Rehabilitation, first and foremost, is a process of education. We train the person to improve themselves and become independent themselves as possible and be as less dependent on others as is possible. Secondly, it's a, a process of setting goals and measuring those goals. Long-term, medium-term, short-term goals with reliable, well-recognised outcome measures. Next, it's clearly a multidisciplinary process. We can't rely on one member of the team, we have to rely on the whole team. Everyone has a role to play in a rehabilitation unit in getting that person to their maximum potential. We need to unlock their potential. Mm -hmm.